I believe that one of the most famous stories in the whole world is the story that we call the prodigal son. There are people who know nothing about God or Christianity or the Bible and can't even tell you that this story came from the Bible and they know the story of the prodigal son. I want to read it to you as Jesus told it. It's interesting to me as a, a student of turnarounds that Jesus' most famous parable, his most famous story, is actually the story of a turnaround. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me that portion of goods that falleth unto me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. The, the first step in any great turnaround in life or in ministry or in a business, but particularly in your own life, is facing reality. There has to come that moment where you look in the mirror, you look at your spouse, you look at your life, and you say, this can't go on this way. So few people are willing to face that kind of reality. And he faces the reality, this boy faces the reality, that he caused it himself. Not all turnarounds begin with the self-destructive decisions that this boy made. Sometimes our life is hindered, hampered, hurt by other people's decisions. No one sins in a vacuum. Every unfaithful husband, every, every uh, uh, immoral or unethical business leader hurts other people around them. And sometimes we need a turnaround out of a situation that's been caused by others. Sometimes the turnaround is historical. That is to say, something happens in the economy or in life, and we have to come out of that. The first thing is to say, I cannot go on this way unless the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change. And change is painful. Change is terrifying. It's frightening. But until the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change, no change will happen. As soon as you say, I'm willing to go through whatever it takes, any humiliation, any, any exposure, whatever it takes, I have to go through this in order to get to the change. You won't go through it. So this boy says to himself, here I am, nice Jewish kid, living with pigs, eating the food of pigs, and he says, I can't go on this way. The second thing is this there has to come that moment where you actually start. Now this is, it seems like a small thing, but I want to say this to you. I have seen people in every kind of situation in the world that say, I'm going to change, I have to change, I need a change, but they won't make the first step. Of all of the plagues of Egypt, the one that always gives me a moment of amusement is the story of the frogs. I always think God must have a sense of humor. Frogs are funny little animals. Agnesh said, God in his infinite wisdom made the fly and then forgot to tell us why. I wonder if God doesn't feel that way about frogs. They are just such funny little creatures. And when God wanted to curse Egypt, he filled Egypt with frogs. Imagine, they were in the cupboard, they're in their bed, they're everywhere. They were covering the land. And this is one of the plagues that broke Pharaoh's resistance. He says to Moses, okay, I've got to change. Get these frogs out of here. And at that very moment, Moses says, when should I remove the frogs? And Pharaoh answers, tomorrow. That is the most amazing answer of all. Listen, I've got frogs in my pajamas. I want them out now. I want them out of my life. I don't want them out tomorrow. At some point or another, we make institutional reality, personal reality. What is wrong, and am I willing to change it? The second step is, it, you have to make the first step. Listen to what this boy says. I will arise and go to my father. And he does. 
He rises up out of that pig pen and starts home. Now, here's the third thing, and this is very, very important. You've got to hear this. No matter where you are, no matter what you're facing, no matter the mess that you have made or that someone else has made of your life, now listen to this, it's not too late. Many years ago, when I was first beginning in evangelism, I was trying to drive home from an out-of-state revival, and I stopped at a Waffle House beside the road. I was exhausted. I was so tired, I was afraid I was going to wreck my car. But when I pulled into that Waffle House, the parking lot was full of Harley-Davidson's, and I knew that there was a motorcycle gang inside. But I was so tired, I couldn't drive on. So I just went on in there, and this was the real deal. This was not weekend warriors. This was not lawyers in leather. This was a very serious look of, group, looking group of people. And I went in and took the back booth, and right behind me there was a couple, and they were arguing when I sat down. And after a few moments, she said something, finally, the straw that broke the camel's back, and he reached across that table and slapped her, and the sound of that just rang out all over the Waffle House. And I could hear her sniffling back there, and I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to stand for this. And I turned around, and he was about 6'6". Six, six. He probably weighed about 300 pounds. He had a chain around his neck. And you know, I thought to myself, if he does that again... I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to get in my car and drive away from here and find a, a payphone and call the cops. But I just froze. I just couldn't do anything. He looked so terrifying. After a few moments, they all got up to leave, and I could hear the choppers cranking up in the parking lot. And th then that girl came out of the ladies' room, and she stopped by my table. She said, are you a preacher? I said, yes, I am. She said, my dad's a preacher. She said, I saw you pray, and, and I... I, I knew you were a preacher. I said, Miss, don't leave with those people. Stay here with me. We'll find your dad. Let's take you home. Let's get you home. Just at that moment, the boy who had just slapped her yelled from the door. And he said, Melody, come on. Come on right this moment or I'll never see you again. Now, I thought she's going to jump at that. That's the best offer she's ever had. Instead, with him screaming at her from the door, tears streaming down her little face, she looked at me and said something that haunts me to this day. She spread her little hands out like this, and she said, can't you see, it's too late. And she left with him. Now, you listen to me. It is not too late. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care the mess that you've made or the mess that somebody else has made of your life. It's not too late. Our God is a God of unsearchable grace, and it is not too late. You see that number that's on, this pay, on the screen right now? I want you to go to your telephone and call that number and say to somebody, Satan has been lying to me. He has been telling me that it's too late, and now I know it's not too late. My Father is still waiting for me. I will arise and go to my Father. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to ask Marcus to come and join me here, and we're going to pray for the great prayers. But I want you to call that number right now and say to the person, pray with me, help me, because I believe it's not too late. I love that message, Dr. Mark Rutland. Thank you so much for sharing it. So many of us need to hear it. You may have blown it. You may feel like you can never come back, but God says, I'm standing here. I love you. I'm waiting on you. And not only will I welcome you back, I will help you come back. God can do something great in your life if you just reach out to Him today. Would you like for somebody to pray for you? Would you like for somebody to stand in faith with you today? Well, I will do that. Dr. Mark Rutland will do that. And people all over the world will join their heart and their faith as well. Get on the phone and call. There's still time to get that call in and for us to pray for you. And while you're calling, I want people to know again about this great book, Relaunch. There's a website. I encourage you to go to that website or go to Amazon.com and go online and order it today. This will help many of you to get from where you are to where you need to be, where you want to be and where God wants you to be. Phones are ringing. 
But God is going to turn this thing around if you'll reach out to him. Dr. Rutten, lead us in Amen. prayer as we close today. Amen. Heavenly Father, you know every need, every life, every yes, name. Oh you know every fact of their lives better than they know themselves. And we're in agreement right oh now God, with partners life. all over the world person. that you are touching these Do lives. Every need. Touch the every miracle heart. turnaround Do is on the way. The change, God, today. because of your infinite, and unsearchable you grace. For your love, for your God, people. touch them. Lives, homes, marriages, thank businesses, presence, companies, churches, spirit, ministries all over the world. The touch them today. with your healing touch and redeeming today. power. And I thank believe you, you for it. I thank, thank you for Jesus. it in advance that Lord we will hear God. these miracle stories yes. in Jesus' Hallelujah. wonderful name, Hallelujah. the strong Son of God. Thank amen. God. Thank amen and amen. Well, you give God the praise. Get in church this Sunday. Get in the Bible. Read in the book of John. Fellowship with other believers. We'll see you again right here on Celebration. Amen.